Welcome to another episode of the Manufacturers Make Strides podcast. I'm your host, Martin Griffiths, and today my guest is Manoli Yanagas. Manoli is the CEO and co-founder of Vault Vision, and that's a smart electrical asset management platform that helps industrial clients to reduce their costs and their CO2 emissions. And that's a hot topic at the moment, with sustainability and carbon zero being high on the list of priorities of many global companies. So let's get right into it now and see what Manoli's got for us. So, hey Manoli, good morning. How are you doing today? Morning, Martin. I'm okay, thanks. Brilliant. Thanks very much for joining me on the podcast today. Um, I just wanted to get started really by finding out how you got involved in electrical power systems. It seems you've had quite a varied career um, doing all sorts of things. So how, how did you get where you are today? Well, it started in, uh, um, in mining. Uh, so I, I have spent 20 years working in the mining industry, um, running um, small uh, mining companies or operations around the world. Um, and about 10, about five years ago, uh, I decided that power and mining is the ongoing problem of a miner. I'll ask any miner, they'll tell you the same thing. It's either uh, unstable power or very expensive power. It's really very difficult to, um, when you're, most mines are not in uh, Oxford, uh, they're in um, Burkina Faso. So about uh, five years ago, my partner and I, Malcolm Evans, who's uh, the co-founder with me on Vault Vision, we decided that, uh, 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 that renewables were a very interesting way to uh, uh, help mines um, come out of, or, or, or to, to start working with mines on renewables to help them stabilize their power and to reduce the power costs and to reduce their CO2, of course. Um, so power systems really started there. Um, Malcolm's a ch um, child electrical engineer, has taught me everything I know, and that's not uh, very much. He still knows an awful lot more than I do. So um, we, our business uh, initially was around how do you transfer a traditional power system onto a renewable power system? Renewable power system is quite um, in unstable. Um, and in the doing of that, every time we went to see anybody, we worked with some pretty big mines in the, uh, back then, uh, nobody had any data on anything. We couldn't, we would ask them, what, where's your power going? What are you using it for? How much do you use? So that we could understand better what their needs would be. And they on the whole had no idea. And that's where Bolt Vision came from. And that's how we got into the power system business. I see. I see. So tell us a little bit about Vault Vision. What's your what's the kind of the goals of the company and how do you see it, it, it kind of growing over the next few years? So Vault Vision is a reaction to that. It's it's um, we were most of the businesses that we work with are high power. Um, uh, um, sorry, high voltage, not high power. Um, and high voltage is a specific is, is, is a lot more complicated than low voltage. Um, uh, and so what we've done is we're interested in providing intelligence to uh, uh, asset owners, we call them asset owners, and that could be a manufacturing company, uh, it could be anybody, frankly, but we started mm -hmm. with the mining business. So mm -hmm. um, what we do is we help our clients understand better how they're using their machinery, the static machinery in their production plants, um, and we do that by uh, recording very high resolution data from existing electrical equipment that would otherwise be lost. It's all there, but it's just not being extracted. Um, and I think a lot of people out there are, are, are running around installing lots of sensors here, there and everywhere. But you don't really need to if you uh, if, if, if you I don't want to say if you know what you're doing, that's 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 condescending. But, uh, it, you know, if, 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 if you look at it closely, you don't have to do that. And on high voltage, you can't do that because people won't let you into their substations to mess around with their equipment. You can do it on low voltage, which is effectively um, the household. And most, I think, UK manufacturers would be medium and low voltage. Um, the big generators and the transportation network and the very large manufacturing companies like a car uh, a facility probably would be, high voltage, would, would be high voltage. So we're interested in providing intelligence to these to these clients, explaining to them how they can reduce their power costs. Because if they don't know what they're doing, or if they don't know where the power is going, or if they don't know how a motor, for example, 
and motors are quite interesting. You know, an electrical motor system takes up, well, the electrical motor systems in the world take up something uh, like 70% of, um, uh, 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 of, sorry, half, of half the electricity used globally and 70% of that is used in the manufacturing uh, community. Okay. So it's a big deal, motors. So we yeah. study motors to help them reduce their power, um, to reduce their CO2, and to increase sustainability. And that's really around life. So we can better help them use those pieces of equipment um, in a way that that machine will last longer. And that can be in fault uh, identification, advanced fault identification, or indeed in we can spot when they're maybe over using a machine for uh, and, and by reducing it 10 to 20 percent you'll get a lot more life out of it in the longer run which yeah. is much more uh, sustainable so that's what we're about we're about provide using data to provide intelligence to um to industrial or in our case mining um clients amazing so like a key thing for lots of global companies at the moment is is sustainability and reducing the CO2 uh, output and reaching net zero. Do you think there are then potentially some big opportunities out there within you know, power usage and within motors that people just aren't aware of at the moment? Oh, a hundred percent. I don't think anybody, well, it's interesting, isn't it? I think when you, and in any established business, when you're a business person, business, and you're running something that is working, you don't really want to change the equilibrium, do you? Because sure. um, ultimately, and this way, we, we, you know, we, we spend a lot of time talking about this here because we appeal to multiple people within a, an organization. And the message you give to one person would scare another person. So yes. the message we might give to a COO would, you know, might scare the head of maintenance, for example. Yes. Um, so, yes, it, 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 there are so many opportunities around motors. I think, and around power systems, the electrical equipment that is being produced now is more intelligent than it's ever been. There are many computers, much of what's sitting on the electrical networks, and they're collecting lots and lots of data. So for the first time, you can actually see what's going on. Um, and you, uh, without wanting to kind of point a finger at someone and say, well, you're not running your system very well, quite often that's what they're doing, but they don't know. So why should they run it very well? I think if, it, with open-mindedness, the ability to um, uh, just on the on, on on how you're actually running an existing system, you, you know, you could be cutting tw up to twenty. I know you can cut twenty percent of most existing existing operations that are not being monitored. They will be running those motors too rich. Those motors will be too big, because when you consider that when you build a manufacturing plant, the people that are building it, the engineering companies that are brought in to do it, they're going to oversize it because they, yes. they don't want anyone coming back at them. So yes. quite often you've got a lot of oversized kit there. Um, and you quite often don't know when a, a, a conveyor belt is running, maybe it shouldn't be running, there's nothing on it. So there's mm -hmm. multiple angles to actually reduce quite easily your CO2 um, uh, emissions by knowing what you're doing and having someone shine the light into the dark room. I see. Yeah. OK, that's re really interesting. So have you got some uh, you kind of covered a couple of examples. Uh, have you got. Uh, can you expand on one of those examples of what what maybe a customer of yours has has done to to, to do something like this to to reduce the energy usage? Well, I, I'll use the example of one mine who actually uh, didn't use our system because it wasn't ready. Um, but what they did was they did something manual. So they went to one of the largest mines in South Africa and they said, OK, let's do an audit of um, exactly how much power we're using here and mm -hmm. where it's all going. It took them a year and they changed out 40 percent of their motors and they wow. saved themselves over 20 percent in power. Um, and that's what we do on a continuous basis. Yes. So it's not an all and one of the interesting parts of what's out there at the moment, and this will start changing and it already is. There are people out there uh, who are beginning to look at this. Most of the big companies give you a, a, an audit twice a year on the performance of your motors on yes. retrospective data. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's not really why you don't need to. You can do more than that now. Yes. Yeah. And if you see something changing, you know, today or this week, you can take if you've got immediate feedback into that, you can take action straight away. 
uh, you, yeah, from a, from a from a from an asset management perspective, that's absolutely right. And but also yeah. from you can see when power starts to dis when you start overfeeding a motor, you can bring it back in line very easily. It doesn't require any capex to do that. Yeah, amazing. So, yeah. Taking a slightly different route then now. So you're involved in you've co-founded Vault Vision. It's a cutting edge startup. What have some of the biggest your biggest challenges been so far, and have you overcome them? <laughs> I'm sure there's lots. To, yeah. To okay. Of. Well, let's just go for two. COVID was an interesting one, but that turned out to be an opportunity for us because yes. nobody. Uh, we worked out quite quickly that well, we didn't work it out. It just happened. We weren't allowed to go anywhere, were we? So yes. um, suddenly we were using conference calls, and so yes. where, whereas normally you'd have to go and meet everybody, you know, our yes. partners are up in. So we work with Brunel University. Uh, on the technical side and um, a group called STFC, who are um, a government agency based just south of in Warrington. Mm -hmm. um, we never met them. We've been going a year and a half. We've never met them because we just do it all on this. So yes. where what's been interesting is, there's, and, and I bring the second challenge in at this point, which is the knowledge gap. You know, I didn't know a lot and Malcolm didn't know a lot about um, the AI and machine learning elements of this and databases. And, and it's been really hard to talk to people on this and get something so technical that we didn't know anything about yes. and yeah. mold it to what we want it to do. That's been yeah. really hard. So there's been yes. a lot of le the learning curve has been steep, but the ability to kind of keep your cool under fire on, on, on it, it, you know, it's easy to do it in the room. So yes. that's been hard. Um, I have to say the British government has been amazing. If I can just give them a plug, I think they get a lot of, um, probably quite rightly, they get a lot of mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, JIT, uh, uh, but they, um, uh, the systems in place to support small high-tech businesses in this country are really, really, really good. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, there are people out there who are just bent over backwards to help you. So that's been amazing. Um, but yeah, the fact that we didn't have to meet anybody has meant that I can have five meetings in a day rather than one. And I think that's really been a massive help. But the chat, any small business, normal challenges, money, um, uh, cutting edge is an interesting concept because you can be too cutting edge, can't you? You can yes. be so cutting edge, you're an evangelist and nobody wants to buy it. So yes. you have to be very honest with yourself about if this is, you just think this is a really good idea or if it is a really good idea and the market agrees with you. And yes. that, that's, that's I, 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 as someone who's done a few, have worked in small businesses and so and I think that's actually the greatest weakness of any new business is the ability to stand back, look at what you're doing and actually unemotionally say, yeah, okay, this can work, this is right. Mm -hmm. Rather than I really like it, let's do it. And in three years time, yeah. it was never gonna work. Yeah, yeah. Um, earlier in your career, um, I saw that you helped to turn around a failing uh, my, uh, graphite production company. Um, what do you think were the key things that worked when in that process of turning that business around? It was a very hard business, actually. And, you know, I say we turned it around. We turned it around in the, in the medium term, but in the longer term, it was never going to be turned around because the asset was not good enough. Okay. What 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 we what we what i inherited was a um it was a mum and pup shop basically run by a very nice guy who had um uh, no concept of systems of of everything was buy it cheap and you know cross your fingers that kind of stuff um and you know operating a business in madagascar um Oh, well, I mean, that has many difficulties of its own, not least distance. So I, mean, I had to move out there for quite a long time. You have to be willing to be present. Uh, I think that's the first thing. You have to be on the site if you're away from something. And this is the one of the tricky parts of mining small mines anyway. Um, uh, uh, you've got to be there. Um, you know, the large miners will obviously have uh, a team all there. So um, it's really about changing culture, changing people. You know that one of the hardest things to do is to go into an existing business and effectively ah oh, yeah i'm glad i don't have to do it again is to say i'm afraid you're not working you're not working you're not working 
we need something new here because that doesn't work. And being really robust about that, and it creates an awful lot of short-term problems. It's emotionally mm -hmm. quite difficult. But, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, so that was one of the first things you, we, we, we did. And then the second thing we did was we, we had to take, we had to nurse a very badly designed uh, manufacturing plant over the line. Um, and in the end, the reason why I said it was always never going to work in the long term was because the investment was never going to be there to be, to, to completely change what was required to be changed, which was the whole production plant needed to be ripped out and started again. And they were never going to do that. And I think you see this a lot in manufacturing with smaller companies where people just, you know, stick it together with sellotape and rubber bands and it'll work in the very short term, but in the medium term, it never does. And you spend a fortune trying to kind of plug the holes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it needs to be designed from the start with the with the end in mind basically with and actually kind of from our like... perspective sorry yeah yeah and from our perspective this is where we so we're doing some work with um anglo-american at the moment and they're doing mm -hmm. a um uh, a ground up uh readers uh, a brand new um plant um it's a hydrogen electrolyzer down in south africa because they're changing their entire um uh truck fleet from diesel over to hydrogen battery um okay hybrids which is very cool so what's nice about that project is usually we're always we're retrospectively fitting uh our, our stuff onto onto an old mine this is brand new so we get to we get to have a say in some of the equipment that we need in order to make it really good and that well, that's just dreamy uh but it's also really nice to see you know a big company design something from the bottom up because they they know what they're doing and they do it really well they got the budget yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds really exciting. Um, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you then and find out more about what you guys are doing in the future? Uh, well, my email address, which is manoli at faultvision.live um, is probably the best way. Um, yeah, I think that's the best thing. Or we'll just go to our, our website, which is www.faultvision.live. Um, and then um, we've got a kind of link through where you can get in touch with me there. Perfect. Thank you. We'll leave links to that in the description of the podcast. So thanks very much for your time today, Manoli. That was really interesting to hear about uh, what, you're, what you guys are doing. Um, yeah, it sounds really exciting. Thanks very much. Thanks, Martin.